To Atticus at Athens, Rome, July, by Marcus Tullius Cicero, translated by Evelyn Shirley Schuckberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The state of things in regard to my candidature, in which I know that you are supremely interested, is this, as far as can be as yet conjectured. The only person actually canvassing is P. Supposius Galba. He meets with a good old-fashioned refusal, without reserve or disguise. In the general opinion this premature canvass of his is not unfavorable to my interests, for the voters generally give as a reason for their refusal that they are under obligations to me. So I hope my prospects are, to a certain degree, improved by the report getting about that my friends are found to be numerous. My intention was to begin my own canvass just at the very time that Cincius tells me that your servant starts with this letter, namely, in the campus at the time of the Tribuncian elections of the 17th of July. My fellow candidates, to mention only those who seem certain, are Galba and Antonius and Q. Cornificius. At this I imagine you smiling or sighing. Well, to make you positively smite your forehead, there are people who actually think that Caesonius will stand. I don't think Aquilius will, for he openly disclaims it, and has alleged as an excuse his health and his leading position at the bar. Catiline will certainly be a candidate, if you can imagine a jury finding that the sun does not shine at noon. As for Ophidius and Pallicanus, I don't think you will expect to hear from me about them. Of the candidates for this year's election, Caesar is considered certain. Thermus is looked upon as the rival of Silenus. These latter are so weak, both in friends and reputation, that it seems past impossible to bring in curious over their heads. But no one else thinks so. What seems most to my interest is that Thermus should get in with Caesar, for there is none of those at present canvassing who, if left over to my year, seem likely to be a stronger candidate from the fact that he is commissioner of the Via Flaninia, and when that has been finished, I shall be greatly relieved to have seen him elected consul this election. Such in outline is the position of affairs in regard to candidates up to date. For myself, I shall take the greatest pains to carry out all the duties of a candidate, and perhaps, as Gaul seems to have a considerable voting power, as soon as business at Rome has come to a standstill, I shall obtain a libera legatio, and make an excursion in the course of September to visit Piso, but so as not to be back later than January. When I have ascertained the feelings of the nobility, I will write you word. Everything else, I hope, will go smoothly at any rate, while my competitors are such as are now in town. You must undertake to secure for me the entourage of our friend Pompey, since you are nearer than I. Tell him I shall not be annoyed if he doesn't come to my election. So much for that business. But there is a matter for which I am very anxious that you should forgive me. Your uncle Cecilius having been defrauded of a large sum of money by P. Varius, began an action against his cousin, A. Caninius Satyrus, for the property which, as he alleged, the latter has received from Varius by a collusive sale. He was joined in this action by the other creditors, among whom were Lucullus and P. Scipio, and the man whom they thought would be official re receiver if the property was put up for sale, Lucius Pontius. 
though it is ridiculous to be talking about a receiver at this stage in the proceedings. Cecilius asked me to appear for him against Satyrus. Now, scarcely a day passes that Satyrus does not call at my house. The chief object of his attention is L. Domitius, but I am next in his regard. He has been of great service both to myself and to my brother Quintus in our elections. I was very much embarrassed by my intimacy with Satyrus, as well as with that of Domitius, on whom the success of my election depends more than on any one else. I pointed out these facts to Cecilius. At the same time I assured him that if the case had been one exclusively between himself and Satyrus, I would have done what he wished. As the matter actually stood, all the creditors being concerned, and that two men of the highest rank, who, without the aid of any one specially retained by Cecilius, would have no difficulty in maintaining their common cause. It was only fair that he should have consideration both for my private friendship and my present situation. He seemed to take this somewhat less courteously than I could have wished, or than is usual among gentlemen, and from that time forth he has entirely withdrawn from the intimacy with me which was only a few days standing. Pray forgive me, and believe that I was prevented by nothing but natural kindness from assailing the reputation of a friend in so vital a point at a time of such very great distress, considering that he had shewn me every sort of kindness and attention. But if you incline to the harsher view of my conduct, take it that the interests of my canvas prevented me. Yet, even granting that to be so, I think you should pardon me. Quote, Since not for sacred beast or oxide shield, unquote. you see, in fact, the position I am in, and how necessary I regard it, not only to retain, but even to acquire all possible sources of popularity. I hope I have justified myself in your eyes. I am at any rate anxious to have done so. The Hermathena you sent I am delighted with. It has been placed with such charming effect that the whole gymnasium seems arranged specially for it. I am exceedingly obliged to you. End of To Atticus at Athens by Marcus Tullius Cicero Reading by Bologna Times